You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hello and welcome to the 100th episode of Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, sponsored by Trailtopia Adventure Foods. Actually, several people thought I was having yet another midlife crisis when I went to hike the Appalachian Trail in 2014, and even more wondered that when I told my friends that I was going to do a podcast. They may have been right. This may have initially been a bit of a vanity project. To be honest, I can't quite remember my motivation for doing the show but I can tell you that I know precisely what it's for now. It took me a while to understand what was happening, but my inbox kept getting emails from listeners telling me how inspired they were from many of my guests. So I know why this show, and I know why this time. The Mighty Blue Show gives hope, comfort, recognition, and even strength to regular people who once thought that they could never, ever hike the Appalachian or other long-distance trails. I think I led the way. After all, people reasoned, if this fat oaf can do it, I should be able to give it a shot. Then they heard stirring stories from my guests of danger, faith, injuries, laughter, tears, and even breakdowns on the trail. They heard about trail magic and the almost indescribable joy of finding a cooler left near a road crossing. Somebody has gone out of their way to drive to the road, lug a cooler full of Powerade and Snickers several yards up the trail for the simple reason that the bloke who has done the lugging just wants the hikers to have a joyous moment. Where else in, as Dixie calls it, the synthetic life, does that happen? Then they heard me talking about and asking my guests for their impressions when they finally touched that almost mystical brown sign at the end of their journey. This is what the show's about. It isn't a vanity project. It's a way of connecting people to that thin strip of land that many of us have dreamed of for years, and it's given its listeners the chance to share the journey and maybe plan their own. Yep, I know that was an unapologetic bit of chest puffing on my own part, but if I can't do it on my 100th episode, where on earth can I? My guest today and my guests next week are two people who meant more to me than any other on my personal journey through that strip of land. We didn't know each other prior to the AT, yet we share an unbreakable bond that it is almost impossible to articulate. Ken Hall, or Lyda Knott, is the guest who is going to round out the first 100 episodes of this show, while Pat Coat, or T-Bird, will start the second 100 shows next week. I initially considered having the two of them on this show, but I didn't want to give each of them anything other than a full show. So Ken is the first and will be on soon. We've got a little more than usual this week, so it's likely to run over its normal length. And my trip to the recent outdoor retailer summer market in Denver has thrown up three more short conversations with companies who had something new to share with me. They're going to be on after Ken. Then, with If I Hit It Again, I invited Chrissy Funk back to the show. Chrissy's episode was published the very day that she left the trail, so she didn't get to complete her through hike. However, I found her to be a compelling, almost visceral character to talk with, with her emotional Facebook posts showing that she was leaving it all out there on the trail. I've been her friend on Facebook for a while now and seen her hit a few trails again for shorter hikes, but I wanted to know how she might handle things differently if she were ever to go again. In typically generous fashion, she accepted my invitation. Chrissy will be along later. But before all of that deliciousness, how about a bit more? When I was hiking, I'd wake up to my alarm deflate my air pad and contemplate my blah breakfast. Every morning I poured water into those different coloured paper bags, scrunched around the ingredients, not one of which had any association with fruit, and then eat that soulless gunk. I then find unhydrated powder and sugar in the crevices of the bag. Troutopia's blueberry oatmeal is a bit of a novelty because it actually has real blueberries. Who'd have thunk? No gunk. It tastes great. The bag design ensures complete hydration and it really sets you up for the day. Try Trailtopia Adventure Food, the best of home cooking away from home. 
So let's meet Ken Hall, who I first met in Connecticut, where we shared a chat one evening at a campsite. I had no idea then that he would be a significant presence in my life in the coming months, but as you've often learned on this podcast, stuff just turns out in mysterious ways. Here's Ken. Right, we're on with my friend Ken Hall, or light or not. Hi, Ken, how are you? Good morning, Steve. How are you? I'm, I'm feeling very good. And you're, you're episode number 100, which means you're a special, special person oh. on, the, on the show. Well, <laughs> and I want to really start about what brought you originally to the Appalachian Trail. Was this something from your past or was it simply one of those retirement bucket list items you decided to tick off? I think it was both. Um, our family, growing up, our family always took vacations to the mountains and, um, uh, right. we always went to North Georgia and, and to North Carolina and Tennessee mountains. That was where we spent our vacation time. Nice. So, uh, nice. uh, that was a natural thing to do, to go to the mountains. So what did it feel like? You know, what, what did it, what did it give you when you were in the mountains in those young, young days and those early days? I always had a, uh, and I can remember distinctly when I was young, um, looking at the mountaintops and thinking, that would be so cool just to go up there and explore, to, <laughs> to walk up that mountain. I mean, it really, I can remember that as a young man. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, uh, my, my grandfather, um, and I might have mentioned this to you before we were on trail, but he was a World War One veteran. And um, he uh -huh. suffered uh, uh, during the gas attack in World War One, And he had limited lung capacity. And so he spent a lot of time. It was easier for him to breathe in the mountains than it was the hot, humid summers of Georgia. So he, um, he spent a lot of time there, and he would carry me to the mountains. And uh, uh, matter of fact, I got, I got a picture of he and I on the AT when I was a young man. Oh, really? So you actually did touch the AT as a kid? Yeah, yeah. Early 60s. Time oh, right. Well, from from your memory, or I don't know how much you remember of it. Do you remember the what it, you know what the AT was like at the time? Was it maintained or was it pretty a rough a no, rough path? No, I don't remember. I, I just remember, uh, you know, and, and probably it's just because of that picture. I remember seeing it. I, I, we just we spent so much time there, and we camped and explored the areas. So I, I don't remember the AT specifically. So, right. so, but you knew that it was something that that was always there. When did you decide that was what you you, you wanted to do? Because I know you you were retired, weren't you? And you you were in um, in the military, weren't you? Yes, uh, I, I spent thirty years working for the Air Force uh, as a civilian, and I retired in uh, twenty thirteen. And right. but uh, it had been on my list for a long time. I'd read a couple books, and um, you know, it, it was just a very interesting thing to me. So I was. Um, I, I had planned a long time to do this. All right. So you, you, you knew you were going to do this. So, and what did Deb, who, who's your wife to everybody, by the way, Deb's your wife, lovely wife. What did she think about you just becoming a hobo for six months? Yeah. Well, I remember, <laughs> I, I remember the day, uh, I came home from work and knew I was going to retire. And I said, Deb, I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to walk the AT. I, I don't think she was listening, but she said, okay. And I said, uh, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, buy probably a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment. And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to probably go by alias. <laughs> a trail <laughs> name, which she didn't understand. Uh, and yeah. she said, okay. I said, are you listening to me? And she said, yes. Yeah. So she was very supportive. From the All right. But, but even if she wasn't listening, that does sound like permission <laughs> to me. So you, you yeah. were good to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And I tell you, uh, that helped tremendously to have her support because it was, a lot, it was a lot of burden on her, as you yeah. understand. You know, she had to continue the keep up the household uh, for six sure. months, you know. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things that we intuitively know or instinctively know that we've had the support from home, that how important that support was. 
But really, it isn't just support by sending you stuff. It's looking after things at home that crop up all the time that you would normally deal with, isn't it? Uh, she becomes she becomes Deb and Ken for a while, doesn't she? She has absolutely. to do all this. She had to, you know, do the chores that I normally do and do uh, yeah. do everything around the house. So it's a, it's a big burden on her. Plus, uh, follow me on the trail. So yes. Yes, amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. Now I've been to Ken's house, and he, he calls it the you call it the compound, don't you? Because uh, yeah. because Ken, Ken's got his his lovely house in Deb, and then I think it's either side, but in the same compound, there's his mum, Mama Jean, who I met, and uh, and Deb's mum. I just can't remember her, her name. I'm really apologise for that. Um, but yeah, Mama Jean. What did Mama Jean think about your mother? What did she think about you doing this? My mother actually hiked some of the AT back in the early 80s. So she purchased all her equipment and spent a lot of time preparing, and she hiked some on the AT. Um, she was not too keen on the idea uh, <laughs> because I think she had experienced it, and it was very it was difficult on her, you know, and she's yeah. – uh, she she didn't want me to go, and I'm the only child, and I, I'm kind of a caregiver because she's – was well in 14 she was 82 so um yeah. you know she didn't she didn't want me to go and it was she evident like- it was evident the day they dropped me off at springer mountain uh, <laughs> uh she really didn't <laughs> didn't want to leave i said mom you got to leave <laughs> oh, that's funny she could have come with you <laughs> yeah 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 that's right. Yeah, I mean, she she was there when you when you and I and T Bird set off on the last day on the 29th of September, twenty fourteen, at Kata- uh, Baxter State Campground, wasn't she as well? And she was really looking for for you coming to come back down that mountain, wasn't she? Yes, she was. She was. Uh, she was so thankful that uh, I had uh, been able to do that and yeah, to sure. do the hike and to to do it safely and to be able to complete it. And she was, she was very happy for me. I mean, it was a, she knew it was a, a great experience. And yeah, I think she was pleased. Yeah. yeah. Help, help that she probably did it herself as well a little bit. Yes. Now, did, did you do much physical condition prior to setting out from Springer or did you just kind of think you'd get your legs and get your fitness on the way? No, I did. I tried to, but you, you know, it, it, we live in a flat, region of Georgia. So right. there's, there's not much you can do here. I did uh, go to the come local, to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> when I come to Florida to find flat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I did go to the uh, local high school and, uh, you know, uh, walk the, the steps at the football stadium and, uh, uh, and, and oh, I remember. Yes. You yeah. Me, yeah. And the year before uh, in 13, I worked with the ATC doing trail maintenance uh i was part of the rocky top crew oh cool and that was uh, that that. was a great experience by the way uh we worked uh, about 10 days in the back country of the smokies right Uh, and so that gave me a, a a hint of what to expect on the trail did you find it I mean, certainly, your ten day, if you're doing ten days trail maintenance, that is physically taxing, isn't it? That's Absolutely. really physically taxing. Absolutely. So, did you find did you find the trail itself to be more physically taxing than you'd imagined, or did that preparation help you get into a mindset of what it was going to be like? No, it, it, it gave me a mindset of what it was going to be like because um, we had to hike into the backcountry to do the trail maintenance, and exactly, we we did some very steep climbs. And uh, I was not in very good condition at that time. Or <laughs> I thought I was in good condition, uh, but to uh, to experience that, it, it was an eye opener. And I said, you know, I I really got to press down and get in good shape to go on this on this trip. Yeah, well, as you may know, I wasn't in the least bit good shape. <laughs> I didn't do any <laughs> didn't do any preparation. But I, I've always told people that I didn't really think that there was any way you can prepare properly for this you going up and down you know going up and down the uh, the high school stadium is a fantastic exercise for certain muscles but yes. one thing i noticed this, this physicality it changes all the time all every muscle comes into play at some stage doesn't it it does it's constantly changing levels it does and I, and i think you there's really i mean you want to be in the best shape you can be but there's no way to prepare for that because it's day in day out um 
lack of food, you know, it, it's just uh, being outside all day long takes a toll on your body. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It really does. Now, so you had a, cl- a very close, tight-knit family and you headed out. What were your early experiences on the trail like? How did you find those first couple of hundred miles? I had a, well, I had read Gene Espy's book. Uh, uh, he, he was the second yeah. uh, through yeah. hiker. And uh, he, he actually worked with my mother-in-law. And so my mother-in-law oh, really? knew Gene. And so I'd read his book and I remember, uh, and I had talked to him prior to, and you know, his main thing was take it slow the first couple of weeks. Whatever you do, just really go slow. So um, that, that was, was the only speed I had. That was the only speed yeah. I had for most of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I mean, I, the first couple of weeks, I took it really slow uh, to try to, to acclimate physically and to being away from home without food. So, you know. Yeah. How, how were you coping with the mental side of it? Because I know, because I know having seen you around your family, I know how close you are to them. How did you find that that part of it? To me, that was the toughest uh, part of it. I hiked with a gentleman uh, a little bit through Georgia and, and a little bit through North Carolina. And it was his, he was an older gentleman and it was his second attempt uh, through hike. And wow. uh, he, uh, he, he told me that, by the time we got to North Carolina, he said, you're, you're in shape. And he said, you can, you've, you know, the difficulty of it. And he said, from here on out, it's probably going to be mental and emotional yeah. effort. So, and it was, I mean, I, I had, yeah. there was a couple of times it was just, I don't know, it's almost a mental breakdown. You just exhausted and you miss home and you're homesick. Yeah. And that's just, a, you go through it. But I, I had kind of prepared myself for it. I thought, I said, there's going to be days like this, you know. Yeah, it's, cope, it's coping with those days in the best way you can, isn't it? And I, I know, as soon as you said that, I thought back to nights when I was in my tent thinking, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? You're hurting yourself. You're falling over. You you miss home. You know, you you could end this pain. You could end this misery in five minutes. By Absolutely. Just, just, but, but I kept... I, I had those same thoughts and I think everybody does, but I, I remember the gentleman, the older gentleman I hiked with through North Carolina, he, it was his second attempt. And he said, he told me, he said, um, if you don't make it the first time, he said, you'll try again. So he said, put every effort you can into it to completing this hike. He said, you'll always have that desire to go back, try it again. And, and that's what he was going through. Yeah. So I, I told oh. myself that a, a lot of times at night. I say, uh, you know, I got to get up in the morning. I got to push it through and yeah. try to complete this. I don't think I would have wanted to go again, other than the fact that I'm going again. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I, I don't think I would have had I had I not been able to do it. I would have thought to myself, I can't do this. And um, one of the great things I took from the hike was knowing, like many of my guests have said to me, I realized that I can do anything that is them saying this and frankly even at my age i feel like i, I can do pretty much anything right now as well so yeah it really get, finishing really gave me that confidence and was there any doubt in your mind at all about whether you could finish or did you just let the hike unfold and use those thoughts that this guy gave you to keep yourself pushing on and on and on no i knew i knew it was something i wanted to do strongly and i i, I haven't felt that in in many things in my life but I said, I am going, I want to do this. So sure. um, the the drive was there. I knew that I could hopefully physically do it, but I, I, I was worried all the time about a fall or injury that would, especially yeah. in the last uh, a few hundred miles in Maine, I, I, was, uh, I was continuously on my mind. I said, if I twist a knee or twist an ankle, yeah. it, it would just be, you know, Mentally terrible to have to um, yeah. stop. Yeah, exactly. So when did you know? When did you know, I'm going to do this? <laughs> you know, that moment you think, I can do this and I'm going to do it. Did you? Was there a moment or was it only when you actually got to the brown sign? No, I think it set in at A-Ball Bridge. We were camped at A-Ball Bridge. And That's right. I, I, could, yeah. I, I, I was laying in my tent looking at Todd and I said, you know, I, I, we're this close. We're going to do, we're going to do it. 
And, and I tell you, it was a sad time for me because I knew that would probably be my last night or next to the last night on the trail. And it was a love hate. I wanted to go home so bad, but I hated to leave the trail. You get really attached to it and to the people. You, certainly do. you certainly do. It's the, and, and it is the people. And, and I know that when we spoke about this before, you talked about your attitude towards the people changed a lot. Could you, would you expand upon that a bit? I, I, yeah, it did. And at the, at the first, the, at the first several hundred miles, I, I had, I found myself kind of trying to measure people. I'd look at people in the the shelters and I would say, you know, I, I don't think that person's going to make it. That person doesn't <laughs> look like they're going to make it. And, yeah. and I was judging people based on what maybe they didn't look like they were in good physical shape or, or, yeah. or whatever, but that's really not what it's about. It's about the determination in that person. And so you shouldn't, yeah. you know, they'll say, and you shouldn't, judge a book by its covers is very true in people yeah and you certainly find out the inside of a book don't you pretty quickly those people when you sit in a shelter with them it's pouring with rain outside and you're just talking and eating you just get that 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 companionship and that that camaraderie that builds up so quickly there doesn't it you sure do and and you can see the determination in a lot of them i mean a a lot of people were just they were so focused on on trying to finish that finish yeah, that yeah. task that they set out to do. Yeah. Well, you we, you and I didn't actually meet until a camping spot in Connecticut. By the way, did you judge me there? Did you think he's not going to be able to do it? No, I tell you, um, I, I remember that campsite. Uh, yeah. But I, what struck me was I think you were having hot tea. I think you were making hot tea that afternoon. I was. Yeah, and I said, "Hey, it's it's so hot, and this <laughs> this guy's making hot tea." I thought that was strange. I said, "You know, from the south, we normally have cold sweet tea." Yeah, so. funny. So we saw each other the next day, but we yep. didn't meet again until the all, virtually the start of New Hampshire. I was just come out of Hanover that day. Did those sort of and and, and, and literally it was three hundred miles apart. I think it was between meetings did those sort of serendipitous meetings happen to you a lot because they really did to me i would see somebody then would see them from a thousand miles or 500 miles and also there you were it was just so amazing to me that i'd met you 300 miles before did that happen to you a lot it, it did matter of fact I, I talked to a lady in pennsylvania who we my first night on the trail was at hawk mountain uh shelter oh. and she was there that day camping at Hawk Mountain when I was camping there. Oh, wow. But I didn't wow. see her again or me for some, all the way to Pennsylvania, our paths didn't cross. So that's Isn't that amazing? It is. It is it's very strange that you're on the same trail, leaving the that's same right. day, and you don't see that person until, you know, a thousand miles later, probably. Yeah, it's just, it's extraordinary. It and when we we teamed we teamed up and we started did a couple of days hiking and then we were actually joined weren't we by um, who, who you'd already been hiking with I think this very cool Japanese guy called Loom. Yes, Loom. yes. Um, had you hiked, had you hiked with Loom for a while? Just a couple of days. Uh, he and I had uh, had lunch together at a restaurant one day and uh, I, I didn't know much Japanese and. I, in, in his English, you know. <laughs> he's, he's Georgia. He's, he's yeah. Georgia. Yeah, I don't think he can understand Southern English, but uh, he, he just had such a friendly personality, and he was just a great guy he to did. be around. So uh, he did, yeah. I enjoyed spending. Shame we didn't hang out with him a bit longer, actually, because he's a real nice guy. Really yes, nice he is. He is. He is. He is. And just before Musalaki, which uh, I think I call it Musalaki. I'm not sure. I think that's how it's pronounced anyway. And I think the name of the hostel, was it the Hiker's Welcome? I think so, hostel? yes. Welcome, yeah. That's where I met T-Bird for the first time. Right. Well, I'd already met her before, and we met up with T-Bird and Trillium. But it wasn't until the day after we'd done Moose Larky, because we slap pat Moose Larky backwards, didn't we? We went up the north side and came down back to Hiker's Welcome. We did. But we actually, actually teamed up with him. Do you remember – I'm putting you on the spot here. Do you remember what it was that we were planning to do? Because I only, only even thought about that this morning. I – well, you know, we we had talked to a guy about uh, trying to transport us as, as far as he could through the whites right. to try to do some uh, uh, slack packing. Um, That's right. And uh, 
I, I remember when we got back to the hostel after that southbound that day, after we did the southbound, yeah. that we were yeah. trying to figure out where we were going to, uh, how we could do the next, the next slack pack, which was, yes. was very difficult and wide. <laughs> yeah. What, what, but once we got into the idea, we were really into the idea, weren't we, of slack packing? <laughs> yes. Yes. I tell you, I'm so glad that we, we teamed up through the, through the whites and, um, uh, in Maine, I was yeah. very uh, concerned about um, falling, or I, I just I had been by myself so much up to that point. Yeah, that, uh, it, it was just a blessing to me to have some uh, companionship through through the yeah. difficult areas. Yeah, because I was going to say actually that that was going to be my next question. Did you feel the need at that time to be part of a team? It was very clear to me that I did. I was falling so much, and if you remember, I would shout out the number of my fall yeah. every time I fell. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I know it was very clear. It was very clear to me that I needed not, not needed some help, but you need some reassurance of somebody. Well, I needed some reassurance of somebody near me if I did fall and fall badly. And I thought the team gelled really well, even though there were one or two flashpoints between. Between some of us, oh, oh, yeah. but we were—we really were a pretty good team, weren't we? Oh, absolutely, and, and I felt the need strongly, and and my wife did too. She said, "I wish you would team up with some, some folks to to yeah. finish these last two states because uh, you know it's so remote. Uh, the accidents do happen, and I was fifty-eight years old, and so yeah, I, I think it gave some comfort to not only to me but to my my family to know that." I was with some other folks. Yeah, but to be honest, Ken, uh, one of the things that I, I've said to people in the past, and I think this, and it really rings true to me again now, I would hate to have experienced the beauty of Franconia Ridge and, and the Bigelow Mountains and various other mountains we went over by myself without turning around to either you or T-Bird or Trillium and said, man, look at that. Isn't that amazing? And sharing that experience with somebody makes it rich, well, made it richer for me anyway. Did you feel the same about that? I did. I remember after we summited Mount Washington, we uh, we eventually climbed up Mount Madison and we stopped on top yes. of Mount Madison just for a short, brief period. And it was yeah. just dead silence, all, all four of us sat there. And I remember distinctly thinking, this is such a beautiful sight that I'm sharing it with really four people I don't know. I mean, I didn't know you guys, yeah. I just had met you. But it was it was such a, a good feeling to know that I was sharing it with somebody, you know. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. And when we spoke the other day about this, you said that one stage, which I hadn't I hadn't remembered you telling me when we were hiking, you were quite close to quitting in Vermont. What had brought that about? Um, Deb had uh, came up to uh, visit me. I was terribly homesick and I was just exhausted. I, I don't know. I probably wasn't eating right. Um, mm. I just couldn't get my strength back. I was just emotionally down and I talked to Deb on the phone and she said, just hold on. I'm going to catch a flight up there and uh, wow. we'll try to work you through this <laughs> period. And yeah. and she did. She flew up and uh, stayed with me for a week and I slack packed and we I ate good. And I, I just didn't take many uh, zero days. And I, that was one of my regrets. I should have took more. And I think she realized that. And then when she got there, she made me go, into towns and eat and try to regain my strength and yeah and, and that, that helped yeah it helped tremendously i think giving yourself a rest every now and then you know, people just want to get the miles done get the miles done get that get the miles done but if you give yourself a rest at least one day a week say then it would really help you complete the whole thing much easier wouldn't it absolutely i only took four zero days the whole time oh my gosh and, <laughs> oh my and gosh. i regret that because i I was so fixed on schedules. I had kind of broken the AT down in segments. I said, I want to be to new I want to be at Newfound Gap on this date. I want to be to Marion, Virginia on this date. Yeah. And I had broken it down to segments. And that put too much stress on me. I don't know why I did yeah. that, but it I, it just felt like I that helped me accomplish things. I, I knew I well, I made it to Newfound Gap. Well, I made it to yeah. Marion. Yeah. I made yeah. it to Harper's Ferry. So it just helped me to break it down, but it 
but it takes something away from it. It takes the spontaneity away from it also. So, Well, well I was going to ask you about that later, but I'll ask you about it now then, because you've had, like me, exactly the same amount of time as me yeah. to look back on the Appalachian Trail, <laughs> exactly to the day, to look back on the Appalachian Trail. Nearly four years since we were on the top of that mountain. We usually do this as a separate sex- segment on the show, which, but if anything, was there, what would you have actually changed about your hike in hindsight, apart, of course, from avoiding me, no, no. no, what would you? No, Jay. What, no. what would you? What would you? What would you change about your hike? Um, I would, I would take my time. I would not put these artificial schedules for me to m- m- try to meet. Uh, I would b- be more spontaneity into it. I, I just, yeah. I, 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 I wanted. I, I kept thinking that I had to be uh, at Katahdin by the first week of October. That was kind of my my deadline. And I think you also had one too. I think I think we all do. I went to the 25th of September because I wanted to get back for my wife's birthday. But yes, I, I, I had a deadline and I, I knew I was going to have to let that go as well. Yep, yep. And, and, and But I, I kept thinking, well, what if I fall and get hurt and then it takes a week to recuperate? Would I still make my schedule? Yeah. It was all those things going through your mind. And I, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I had just said, look, I'm going to go and it, where I stop today, or is you know, is yeah. where I stop today. You know, it's just well, that's my plan for next year. Is definitely to just do it as I do it, and and I'm going to tell people if I'm going to be in a town somewhere and say if you fancy meeting up for a drink in such and such bar in Damascus or wherever it's going to be, then I'll be there on that evening. And yes, I'll, and I'll do it a couple of days in advance on a podcast. So yeah. you know, it should be enough for me to to be, be able to meet that schedule. So I'm kind of looking forward to that and enjoying more of the views. Quite often, I didn't go out. There was like a, a viewpoint 200, 200 yards off the trail. I often wouldn't take those. I'm going to take quite a few of those, I think, next time. Make sure I see all the views I possibly can when the weather's good. Because if, if you go there and the weather's lousy, you're not going to see a view. So I wouldn't take a detour then. But now I think I'm going to see all the views I can possibly see. I know. Yeah. I know. At, 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 at times, I felt kind of jaded with the views. I'd say, oh, I saw, I've, I've seen, I've already seen a beautiful view. And so I, yeah. I wouldn't walk that extra fifty yards yeah. to yeah. to a dispute yeah. of old overlook. So I would just keep on yeah. walking. So um, yeah. if I had to do it again, I would stop. I think yeah. it's it's healthier for you. I think it's less stress on your body to, to rest more. I totally agree. Now this is for me as much as it is for the listeners, by the way, because I was there. So think back to that day on the morning of the 29th of September, two thousand fourteen. We were in Baxter State Park. You'd been in Millinocket with uh, Deb and Mama Jean and T-Bird and I had, had camped there. We met up in that morning. What were you feeling? And and tell the listeners and me how, how the climb went. <laughs> um, well, um, it was a adrenaline rush. I don't know. It just I had this sense of energy all of a sudden that uh, – yeah. I was just ready to kind of explode up the mountain. And I remember <laughs> that morning, uh, T-Bird led the way. And, yeah. and I remember her pace. We were following T-Bird for a way, and she was yeah. just blowing up the mountain so fast. Yeah. yeah and um, it, it was just a great, it was a great feeling. It really was. Yeah. We, we were all in good shape by then as well, of course. So we, we were. And, and, you know, I had read cool. where Katahdin was so difficult, and it was. It was a difficult hike and climb, but. Um, at that point, it was so much adrenaline, so much, uh, uh, rush that, to, to go do it. And it was just, it was an exciting day. It really was. Yeah. And it was exciting as we came to the sign. We didn't know the sign was there. We kept looking up, hoping to see the sign, didn't we? Yeah. And I remember looking up, looking up and suddenly I could see people all, all around it and just, it was just so awesome. I know the, the weather forecast had called for sleet and uh, light snow that day. That yes, morning. Yes. So uh, yeah. it was it just it, it, we, chilly. It was cloudy. It got yes. cloudy and it was quite, it, quite chilly. But it, yeah, yeah. It, it, we didn't get, we didn't get snow, did we? That was fine. That's right. It was okay. We didn't get snow. Yeah. So we got to the top, and you had a you had a quiet prayer at the at the sign, and and that image of you kneeling at the sign, uh, yeah, kneeling at the sign, is still one of the most powerful images of the whole trail for me. And I don't even have a picture of it. I can see it right now in my mind. And I know your faith's really important to you. It Did is. the trial strengthen it? And were you thanking God for bringing you through it? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to 
get into you know what you're praying no. about necessarily. But you yes. know, I did, how how were you feeling about, about that moment then? Well, as you know, it was an emotional rush. I mean, yes. I was just so full of emotion when we got there when I first saw it. But we kind of had to wait patiently in line to because uh, yes. yes. there was other people there, so we wanted to wait to our turn to to touch the sign. So, but I remember. That prayer actually started on Springer Mountain because Mom and Deb dropped me off on April fifteenth, and um, yeah. we held hands and hugged. And my mom said a a very lengthy prayer. I I, I think she kept praying, thinking that I would <laughs> change my mind. But uh, she prayed. She prayed for us safety and uh, well being, and, uh, huh. and and right before I walked away on Springer Mountain, she said that uh, if you make it to um, uh, Katahdin, uh, promise me that you will thank God for that opportunity. And yeah. I, I promised. So, yeah. But I, I do remember approaching the sign, and I just remember being totally overcome with emotions. And, um, and uh, I, I remember thinking, it's over, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity. I really was, and for the experience, for the friendship, and for safety, and just for letting me complete that experience uh, in such a lovely place. Yeah, magical. And it, and you know what? The great thing about it, and as Odie, I don't know if you know Odie, uh, he, he would say, this belongs to all of us. We're, we're hiking royalty because this is ours. From Springer Mountain to Maine, we can all hike on the Appalachian Trail. How lucky are we to be able to do that? It's just amazing, isn't it? It, it really is. I, I just I just love the AT. I, it, it's just a, a great American institution. I hope it's always protected. I hope it's always guarded. And yeah. I try to keep it for, for what it is. It is yeah. just a beautiful part of this country now you you return home and you <laughs> when we're on the trail you talked about it you said your next three years next five years we're going to be the go 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 years so quite apart from the fact that we both tried to do the john muir trail together in 2016 so let's forget about that because that didn't last terribly long <laughs> yeah. where else <laughs> where else have you hiked with deb uh well the following year we had uh, this was part of our go, go, go years after our retirement. So, uh, yeah. in 2015, we did hike the Hadrian's wall. She hiked it with right. me. And then in, uh, 16, we hiked the, uh, Kerry way in Ireland. That was a beautiful hike. That's about a 130 mile hike, but it's just nice. a beautiful hike. And then, uh, last year we hiked the El Camino for Ron yeah, that is a pilgrimage, isn't it? As a, and that probably was for you as well. Was that was that a similar feeling when you got to the end? Yes, it was. It because uh, well, it's a different, it's a totally different hike. It's hard to explain, but it it's a it's a social hike, and it's it's a, it's a little bit more of a spiritual hike. Right. And uh, and to see Deb go through that with me, and to go through those phases of emotion. I mean. We were doing like 13, 14 mile days, and she, yeah. I, I could see her. She was getting exhausted. And she was getting tired. Then all of a sudden, uh, after about 10 days, 15 days, I could see her. She was getting her energy back. She was getting in condition. And so it was, it was great to see her to go through that and then to reach Santiago and, um, and touch that cathedral and to end sure. the hike. It, it was great to experience it with her. Well, I'm hopeful I'm going to be experiencing some of that this year, obviously, when I try to do it myself. But uh, now, those go, go, go years were slowed down a little bit by a health scare last year. Or was it earlier this year? I'm not quite sure. Tell us about what happened. Well, uh, I was I was back at the high school stadium, uh, walking the steps, uh, running the steps, trying to get in shape. We were going to hike with some friends in uh, England. We were going to hike for a couple of weeks with them. So I said, well, I need to get in condition. And, and so uh, uh, one morning I uh, was working out pretty hard and fairly hard. And just I had all the classic signs, the nausea, the sweating, the uh, chest pains. And uh, I, I knew I knew what it was. And so uh, I had a heart attack. So I, I had always taken care of myself. I thought I was always in good shape. I ate right. Didn't do it. Didn't have any bad vices. So. I thought I was doing everything right, but I think uh, genetics took took over, and 
And uh, yeah. so I had a heart attack. How has that impacted you? Well, it, it has, it, 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 it puts doubt in your mind. Um, and yeah. I, I, it, I had my heart attack in May of 17 and we were already scheduled to do the Camino in, uh, in September, starting September. All right. Uh, um, it, it puts that little doubt in you mind. Can I do this? Um, but, uh, you know, the doctors assured me that everything was going to be fine. And Very cool. Well, I'm, I'm obviously I'm glad you, I'm glad you're better and you, you feel, you feel well now. You look well when I saw, when I saw you when we first dialed up here. Um, I, w- I want you to finish with a story that you told me about the ripples that your hike has had and the impact it has had on other people. Because you told me the other day, and I, and I think it speaks to the way in which all of us touch people we've never even met. Tell us about that. Well, um, you know, you don't realize sometimes the things you do, how they influence people. And um, yeah. I, I had a lady, an older lady, who um, came up to me one day, and she's, I think she was a friend of, friend of a friend of a friend. And she said, you don't, you don't know me, but uh, my name is so-and-so. She said, I uh, followed you on the trail. I said, well, good. And she said, uh, and by the way, I uh, always forwarded your post, your trail journal post, to my granddaughter, who, was, uh, who at that time was living in Europe. She was going to school in Europe. And so she said, my granddaughter was following you. And I said, well, great. She said, I just want to thank you so much. She said, we enjoyed your post and following you. And she said, congratulations on finishing. And I said, well, thank you. She said, uh, I said, Oh, did you, is your granddaughter interested in hiking? She said, Oh no. She said, she doesn't want to hike now. <laughs> After, <laughs> After seeing what all you went through. I was, so I was kind of taken back. I said, well, uh, you know, what you thanking me for? I didn't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, and the first of 15, after we, I got off the trail, Deb and I went to Israel. Uh-huh. And uh, we spent some time in Israel, and we both were baptized. Well, I, I posted our baptism on, uh, on my Facebook page, and her granddaughter was still following me on my Facebook page. And uh, uh-huh. she saw that, so she called her grandmother, and she said, I want to I, I do that. I want to do what Ken and Deb did. and. Uh, Wow. And so her grandmother was thanking me, and she, and her his, her granddaughter did do that. She she took a flight to uh, Tel Aviv and caught a bus to Galilee and uh, and was baptized. So her grandmother was, was thanking me, and that was very emotional. I'm sure. I'm sure. So yeah. you, you you influence people you don't you don't know, and I, I thought that was very odd. I agree. I can, I agree, Ken. I, I think it's it's a lovely feeling that we were all putting out tentacles into the world, and some people are grabbing hold of them, and some aren't. Obviously, yeah. some are grabbing hold of them, and and it means something to some of them. So, anybody yeah. out there hiking, you know, it isn't just you out there. It's it's you, your family, and people who are watching you hike. So, you know, I think that's a it's a great old story. Yeah, yeah. Well, look. As, al- as always, you know, we don't speak to each other as much as we should, but, you know, I love chatting with you, Ken, and I really enjoyed you being part of this 100th show. Because well, this is thank a, you. A I enjoyed show. it. I, mean, I enjoy talking with you. It's a, it's a big show big show for the podcast, I tell you. So, obviously, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you and T-Bird are two of the people that I really wanted to feature in the, this and the next show. So, um, I really appreciate spending the time. Say thanks to Deb, um, Mama Jean, and Sandra. Yeah. Uh, and, and and wish them well for me, okay? I, I will. I will. And thank you. I enjoyed talking about it. It was, it was such a great experience. I love talking about it. I appreciate it. Okay, mate. Speak to you soon, right? Okay. Bye. Bye. Do you know, I don't recall him telling me that he'd done maintenance with the Rocky Top crew. What a great way to prepare for the trial. I hadn't noticed when we were recording quite how much the two of us laughed when we'd been chatting, though I guess that comes from the sort of reflexive comfort that you quickly achieve in each other's company when you share the trail for some time. And for that bloke who told me once on this show that I laugh way too much and way too insincerely in my interviews, get over it. You're going to find that laughter is the primary emotion on the trail with your friends, and I certainly regard Ken and nearly all of my guests as friends. I also don't recall hearing Ken tell me before that he wanted to hike in a group because of concerns for his safety. 
I think it's kind of intuitive to gravitate to like-minded people when things start to get tough, and New Hampshire was certainly tough. It was so lovely to speak with him again, and I hope you'll forgive this self-indulgence of reliving my own adventure. I'm also, of course, delighted that his heart attack turned out to be a mere blip in his go-go-go years. May you have many more, Ken and Deb. Now let's move on to a few of the neat things I saw at the Outdoor Retailer Show. First up is a ridiculously simple yet highly efficient invention. I just happened to be wandering past when I saw a shower from a smart water bottle. I stopped by, had the inventor James Pete explain it to me and recorded him then and there. Here's James and his simple shower. Okay, we've got something interesting now. Um, I'm just going past the stall and I've just met James Pete with The Simple Shower and he showed me how you can take a shower with one litre of water, which in my case would have been almost impossible, let me tell you. But now it looks like you can, so tell us about it, James. Well, I can tell you, Steve, that I guarantee one thing about The Simple Shower is you will get wet. Simply attach it to any one, one and a half or two litre pop bottle, um, or you can use a platypus bladder or any other collapsible bottles. Sure. And with one litre, you can actually rinse yourself completely off. Uh, two liters will allow you to actually get a navy shower in, which is, you know, face, pits, crotch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three liters gives you a full shower, and uh, we usually like to recommend you using a fourth liter as the ah liter. That's where you sit there and you go, ah. Uh, right. uh, it's lightweight, weighs less than an ounce. Uh, anybody can check out uh, reviews online. Our website is simple-shower.com, where we link it to numerous reviews online, uh, especially for those who are into backpacking. Uh, it's made from recycled high-density polyethylene in Washington State. We use recycled material in our uh, manufacturing process yep. and in our packaging. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about well, it? It's, yeah. It comes in one color, black, uh, or as Henry Ford says, you can have it in any color you like as long, long as, as it's black. black. Yeah. <laughs> So ha tell me how it actually works and where, where it's actually going. Well, there are three parts to it. Uh, there's a cap, which actually you know, consists of a uh, number of holes like any other shower head. Yep. Uh, in the center of a cap is what we call the air evacuator tube. A lot of people just call it the straw or the tube. Yeah. And then there's the funnel that actually attaches to the bottle. Uh, and you could actually use that to fill it up, make it a lot easier to fill up the bottles. And then you simply screw the cap back on. Sure. With the, um, air tube inserted in it and lift it above your head. And what it's, the principle I like to tell most people is, do you remember when you were in college and you actually saw somebody shotgun a beer? <laughs> it's the same principle. Same principle. All that's happening is that the air evacuator tube is actually displacing the water in the bottle with air, which gives you a good solid flow of 1.8 gallons per minute. I can tell you, it was it was quite powerful flow as well. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of difference. Yeah, a, a one liter bottle lasts about 18 seconds. One and a half liters will take you about uh, 24, 26, I don't recall exactly. And a two liter bottle will take you 36 seconds. Now, that seems like an awfully fast shower, but if you watch our video on the optimal use of the simple shower, you will see that one liter will be very efficient in getting you completely rinsed off. It's a combination of the flow and the number of holes that actually allow us to do sure. that. Um, if you've ever used a solar shower, you have to raise it, what, four to six feet above your head. It <laughs> weighs 24 to 40 pounds, and it's got a really wimpy nozzle spray, and it takes you forever to get rinsed off. Uh, with the simple shower, you get wet, you lather up, you rinse off. Cool. Like I said, we guarantee you will get wet. Well, what I'll do, I will link your video, your YouTube video in the show notes so people can see it in action. That would okay? be great. That's super. Well, thanks so much for talking to us. Steve, thank you very much. Oh, where, oh boy, yeah. where, where can we get it from? Uh, it's available currently through our website at www.simple-shower.com. Uh, the MSRP is $12.99. We also sell it on Amazon for Prime members. Uh, our goal, though, is to shut down our website in the near future and have it sold through your local retail. All right, cool. Okay, yep. well, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. How about that? I tell you, I really liked it, and I will definitely be getting one for the AT next March. There were several solar chargers that caught my eye, but this week I've got Ethan Devine of Solar Camp telling me about the Solympic Hue. It's an interesting, very light and foldable charger that seems to be very efficient. Here's Ethan.
Right, this is Ethan Devine from Solar Camp. And Ethan, um, I was telling you, I've got a, I had a, had a solar panel when I hiked the trail in 2014. Uh, and obviously being in the trail, it's not desperate in, in the Appalachian Trail with the trees above us all the time. It's not easy always to get sun. But this is something slightly different and much, much lighter than one I had. Correct. So the difference between our solar chargers and most other solar chargers is that we use a different technology. So it's called CIGS. And one of the great things about CIGS is it's better in real life conditions. And what we mean by real life conditions are cloudy days or low light conditions, things like dusk, dawn, those types of things. How does it do that then? It's a more efficient solar absorption. So the panels themselves, they're very different. They're flexible. I so. saw. Yes. And so when you're hiking or when you're camping, you're never going to be necessarily at a perfect angle to the sun, but having more flexible panels will help you pick up more of the sun when it's on your backpack or if it's laid out somewhere, things like that. And then the panels themselves are more efficient at energy absorption as well. So tell us about this. This, uh, I will have a picture. I'll take a picture when we finish talking so I can put it on the show notes. Um, this, this particular thing here, the, the Solympic Q series. You pronounced it correctly. How about that's that? no easy feat. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us what, what we're looking at here. Sure. So that's a foldable solar charger. That's actually our flagship product. It's yeah. 7.6 watts and it's ultra efficient. So again, it can charge an iPhone from zero to 100% in about 1.8 hours, a little less actually. Which is pretty darn good. It's pretty good for solar chargers. Yeah, yeah. And what other uses have you put it to? Because I see you've got this amazing umbrella, yes. <laughs> which is extraordinary. So again, the beauty of the technology is it's so thin and flexible, you can have a variety of different applications. So as you can see here, we've got a patio umbrella that's been outfitted with the solar panels on the upper canopy. So we've got 12 watts, and then you've got a junction box with two USB ports and a power bank inside. So again, you can charge on cloudy days, you can charge at night when you're sitting on your patio, yeah. you can bring it to the beach, and so it's great. You never have to be without power. So where are you guys available? Where, 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 where do you sell your stuff? We are based in San Diego, and our products, you can reach us both at our official website, which is solarcamp-usa.com. Solarcamp-usa.com, yeah. Correct, or you can find us on Amazon within the next month or so. Oh, God. <laughs> You're in the worldwide, worldwide shop, yeah. That's right. Yeah, That's right. Certain that. SKUs will be available on Amazon. We're also for the solar patio umbrella. We're doing a Kickstarter campaign starting next month, so check us out on Kickstarter. And now, of course, the dangerous bit. How much are these going to cost? It depends on the SKU. So the Olympic Q series, that yeah. has an MSRP of 129. 129. The slightly smaller charger, which is a 7 watt, that has an MSRP of 99. Okay, that's not too bad compared to some of the things I've seen, so that's not bad at all. Well, thanks for talking to us, appreciate it. It's nice to meet you, Steve. Cheers. Lastly, but by no means least, we've got Andy Barutis of the strangely named Alchemy Labs. It's not immediately apparent what Alchemy Labs does, but let me tell you, they have a wonderful product. Here's Andy to explain. Okay, I'm here with Andy Barutis of Alchemy Labs. Uh, a relatively new company, I understand, Andy. Tell me how long you've been in business. Yes, this is actually our, just our second full year in business. All right. And uh, we actually already have, have had some great reviews from consumers on our product. We won some major awards. We were named by Apparel Magazine as a top innovator in the industry. Okay. Won the Pfizer Get Old competition, which recognizes breakthrough innovation. It helps people live better and longer. Well, of course, having the name Alchemy Labs, we have no idea what you sell. So yes, <laughs> we, we sell technical apparel that utilizes radiant barrier technology. That's what makes our product so amazing. Radiant barrier technology is the same technology that has been used in the creation of spacesuits to help protect astronauts from intense solar radiation. It's also the same uh, technology that's been used in home insulation to help right. keep homes cooler. So what we've done is taken that technology and applied it to apparel. And so what is, so what is it? What is that stuff? It, it, it's uh, a combination of materials. It's actually an aluminized film that we laminate to a, uh, a polyester type of material to soften it. And it, it's really critical that we have the right amount of thickness for both the radiant barrier and the backing material. The, and so, so how... I always interrupt, sorry about this, just because I, I forget things, so I have to ask it straight away. <laughs> so how how resilient are these to bad bad treatment? You know, people chucking the hats all over the place and that. The hats are very du durable. The material actually, the radiant barrier is non porous so you can be out in the rain and you'll all be right. fine. Oh, cool. Uh, they are very, you know, they can be, uh, you know, hand-washed, you know, with detergents and things like that. 
Okay. Uh, and they, they won't make they, it, they, won't, won't impact it at all? No, and they fold flat, you know, that you can crush them, collapse them. Sure. Now, the thing that you told me, which is, you said it reflects up to 80% of yes. the sun's heat waves, but, but my, I then asked you, when we were talking about it before, how much normally goes through, and you said all of it. Yes, it, it, with regular textile materials, all the heat is absorbed and eventually has to go through. And the example that I like to give is in a home that's very well insulated in the roof. Even on a very hot day, uh, you, you might stay cool during the day, but during the night, the heat starts to go through, right, through the in, into the house. Okay, uh, and that's because it's insulation. With our product, the it's not insulation, it's actually reflecting the sure, heat. Sure, sure. So heat waves travel through, they're called infrared waves, they're not visible, uh, but we actually reflect those waves as well as block virtually all UV rays. Right. And UV rays are the ones that cause skin cancer, they're the damaging waves. And we block 99.8% of skin damaging UV rays. And these days that's extremely important because one out of five people get skin cancer. Yeah. So I've you want to protect yourself. I've had two myself. Uh -huh. so, I, I, so you, you have to protect that. yourself. And you know, especially if you're going to be in that, you know, outdoors and hiking or you know, running or whatever you're going to be doing outdoors. So what's the, what's the reaction been so far from my, my area, which is the, hike, the hikers? Oh, it's great for hiking, and I, and I can speak to that because I, I'm an avid hiker myself. All right, cool. I, you know, hike, you know, four or five miles a day in, in Arizona, and there, right now, it's about 110, 115 degrees every day, so <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do my hiking without, you know, the Alchemy Sun hats. And this is going to be a stupid question, so please forgive me. How does it keep you, does it feel generally cooler? You, you will definitely feel cooler. Uh, wearing our hat, and it's really a combination of things. Not only do we reflect the sun's heat waves, but we've got some very aggressive ventilation on the hats, right. and we have moisture wicking sweatbands. All right. It's all designed to be a system that keeps you cool, comfortable, and protected. So how can people actually get, well, firstly, the one, and, and this is audio, so it's tough to show us, but I will take a photograph afterwards. This is your bestseller, which is the river hat. River hat, the river hat. And that is, how much does that come up at? It uh, retails for about $35, okay. and, and it's available on our, on our website, alchemylabs.com. A-L-C-H-E-M-I labs, L-A-B-S, dot com, okay. And also you can get them on uh, Amazon, right. eBay, and... and of course uh, you can. <laughs> and anywhere, you yeah, just yeah. Yeah. Google Alchemy Sun Hats and you'll find our hats. But you've got a bunch of different hats here, haven't you? So just, yes. to, I mean, I'm going to take a picture of all of them so, all, so all together. So we, we've got the river hat, which has the asymmetrical brim, and it's great for hiking for you know people that are going to be spending a lot of time outdoors. Interestingly, uh, ultrathon runners, people that are running 50 mile races and above, yeah, yeah. love this hat because it protects them and you know, protects the neck area as yeah, well. Yeah, you said that. You said it's slightly longer at the back there, yeah. Yes, it's got an as what we call an asymmetrical brim. So the rim, yep. brim is longer on the back, it folds over your neck area. Sure. And if you're trying to you know, stay out of the heat, it has a very wide area of coverage. So sure. you're actually protecting yourself from the sun you know, up to like your mid chest level. Sure. Uh, we also have the sun cap, which is uh, a great cap for someone that's going to be very active whether you're running or golfing sure. or playing tennis. Yeah. Uh, we have a desert hat which has a shroud on the back, so if you've had skin issues, especially in the ear area, which is the most common place, it's a great product to have. A lot of gardeners love our, yeah. our desert hat. And then we've got the expedition hat, uh, which is you know great for... So, so how does that, how's the expedition hat? Do it looks very similar other than the color? To the the, the river hat. hats will sit a little bit lower on your head. It's all got right. a lower crown. All right, right. Okay. And yes. The desert hat is a higher crown. So if you've got an extremely large head, you might want to go with the expedition hat. <laughs> uh, but it's also more of a casual hat. This is, you know, the river hat is more of a hat that you're going to use when you're going to sure. be, you know, and, and just, just outdoors. Just to put a lid on it, the you said there are, there are other opportunities for you as a company in terms of commercial use. So, so what, what's happening there? Well, we're, we're looking at a lot of different areas. We were actually approached by landscaping companies, construction companies, asking us to, to uh, create products for their industry specifically because they're outside all the time. And like if you're in construction, working on sure. hot concrete, sure. you want something that can perform like our product does. Sure. Well, I appreciate the time you've taken uh, to tell us about it. Thanks very yep. much indeed. Thank you. Cheers. I really like that river hat. 
And despite the fact that I look like a complete idiot in most hats, I'm going to get one for my Camino trip in October. So now we've got our bonus content in... If I did it again. Chrissy Funk comes back to the show. And Chrissy and I chatted about the changes that she will make when she gets back to the AT. Here is the lovely Chrissy. Right, I'd like to introduce a previous guest on the show, Chrissy Funk. Hi, Chrissy. How are you? Hello, hello. I am well. Thank you. <laughs> you always sound so up as well, which is great. <laughs> um, no, let's do it. As I you were a guest on the show. Um, and when I think you did you start doing a flip flop? Did you start from yes. Harpers? Harpers Square, West Virginia. That's right. And and the episode aired, and we had a really nice chat, and you were really up, and we talked about how. You know, you'd been very public on Facebook and so on. And then the very day that it aired, you put up a Facebook post that you'd had to leave the trail. What happened? It was, at that point, it was about three months into my trek. And during my walkabout, I knew I wanted time on the trail, but also to reconnect with humans. Because in my business, it's really hard. I am the job. I live the job. So mine was very unique. I was on and off the trail during those three months. Yeah. Do I would do like a hundred miles and then I'd run off to be in a wedding or a uh, run off to be in, attend a baby shower. Uh-huh. Uh, but when I got to the three month mark in totality, something hit me. It was day in and day out. I was finding myself unsettled and I was dreaming of being elsewhere, which is quite odd considering how amazing the trail is. Yeah. And at that point, uh, my highest, highest mileage hike was that the day that I actually decided I was done. Mm. And at that that time, it was 24 miles. So I ended on a freaking amazing day. <laughs> it was beautiful. The weather was perfect. And uh, it, I was like, I'm being kissed by Mother Nature. Yeah. So I hike, I think it was around 20, 22 or 24 miles. And I get to a point and I'm like, I had a really bad feeling about the shelter. I was going to keep uh, pitch a tent outside the shelter. And I was like, you know what? Some guy just gave me this amazing woman's phone number. I'm going to hike into town mm-hmm. and stay with this family. Cause if, as a single female, you have to be very aware and in tune. And of course, of course. it's one of the things where you just can't deny that scared feeling. So I'm like, okay, you know what? It's just meant to be. I didn't realize that what I thought was my highest mileage was then going to get to, I was two to five more miles in it. <laughs> so uh. even when you think you have nothing left, you do. So I get to finally get to the uh, place where I'm staying and I spend a night there. And as I'm looking outside the next day, I wake up, I'm like, I'm going to spend one more day here. And during this process, I decided it was time to get back to something, something else, not on the trail. Some version of real life. Right. Yeah. So-called real life. (laughs) Yeah. So-called real life. I don't know which one's more real, but So, so you, so you finished there. Do, do you think when you started, do you think that you were sufficiently prepared emotionally for the trial? Because some of your posts prior to that had been really emotional. You, you really were, you had compelling Facebook posts. You know, you were upset quite often, and but other times you were joyous. So, was it a real up and down a roller coaster for you? It was. So, to give a little background context to that, I had been going through a massive life change. Right. And that life change, I questioned my whole identity, who I was. I had no self-confidence, right. which is uh, odd considering everyone looks to me as uh, a superwoman. And, but at this ter- time during my life, I was a, f- a nothing. I was empty. And so I wanted the trail to be something. I should not have gone onto the trail with expectations. Uh, I thought it was going to be my therapy to get me through. And then I would just magically come out different, but it's Mm. perfect because I didn't deal with anything. I really had to, but I got to enjoy the moment. I actually finally learned what it was like to live in the now and not fear about the future, not freak out about the past. And that's what made my time on the trail so amazing and why I probably romanticize and lust over it to this day. Yes. Now, I know you've done some hiking since, but would you ever consider going back and doing the whole trail again? Or is that not something you really would consider? Oh, I will definitely be. Uh, it, whether it's lashing or or an attempted through hike again, I will be out on the trail again. And whether it's the Appalachian Trail 
or another amazing trail in this, you know, in the United States or somewhere else, it will happen. I, I'm, I'm kind of eyeing up the mountain to sea trail, the Colorado. I, mm. I, I have my eye in a couple of different places, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so this, for the purpose of this, you know, this is called if I did it again. So yeah. if you were to prepare for the Appalachian trail again, yeah. would you think, and how would you do things differently? Well, would there be a number of things you'd do or, or are you quite happy with how you prepared and, and, and you wouldn't change those things? One of the biggest things I realized about myself was is truly appreciating and understanding what it means to hike your own hike. Next time I get on whatever trail it is, the, the AT or whatever, I will fully enjoy hostels. I will not care if I do eight miles one day and 30 miles the next day. I'm not going to be a, a mile cruncher. Like you just get into these waves of, well, I've established this landmark of doing a through hike. Let me get to this next big pivotal moment. And because yeah. and as you might remember, I started with Bear Bag when he did my uh, shakedown. I, was around- I do remember. This is how we actually met. I remember. That's right. I was like, oh my God, I was around 40 or 45 pounds. And I was <laughs> like, oh yeah, I'm going to take all my equipment. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to edit. And I'm going to wear all of my fears in my bag. (laughs) (laughs) But by the end, uh, since I was a flip-flopper, I truly flip-flopped. So I got all the way to Kent, Kent, Connecticut, and then I flipped around. I did some in um, Vermont. Uh, I went to New Hampshire. I did some in Georgia. But what I would say is I went from the extreme heavy to so lightweight. I cut out my – I went cold food. Oh, did you? How did you find that? Uh, when I started, so I have a bunch of trail families, which is a blessing of getting on and off the trail. I'm sure. So when you go with the in and out of these different groups, you learn their techniques and what they believe makes a great through hike. Uh And one person who I love dearly is an amazing person. His method was going cold because he's, I would say he's an ultra lighter, even though he would never call himself that. (laughs) (laughs) And he taught me some great things on how to go cold, still be happy with the trail. And from when, when I did it, it was great. Cause going through the whites, I mean, when you're doing one mile an hour, yeah, oh, yeah. less weight is great. No question. No question. At the same time, uh, I did a through hike in Pennsylvania with another dear friend, um, Sisu from um, the Appalachian Conservancy. And he would make me a warm coffee every morning when we woke up and I'm, and it was that moment. I was like, you know what? I will carry a jet boil for coffee. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of people do that specifically for the coffee because that's the thing. I don't think I could I could have survived without coffee. So I think I, I'd always thought of perhaps going cold, but not having coffee in the morning would be a nightmare for me. And it's not just the coffee. It's the shared community. So I know when I was carrying my jet boil, I would make coffee for other people. And then it's a, time, a shared time to sit down, relax, and reflect. If, whether it's in the morning or the end of the day. Yeah. Now in the morning, I will say it's, I did change and I will do again. I was the kind of person who originally was like, oh, I'll get up at six. Well, then by the end of my trek, I was getting up at three or four because I became an early riser. <laughs> and that just was due to I wanted to prove to myself that I could do high mileage. And it, it was a true test of – Hang on, hang on, hang on. What, that's interesting. Now, why did you feel the need at that time to prove to yourself you could do high mileage? Uh, I think one of the reasons I wanted to prove to myself is uh, being a former obese child, there are a lot of obstacles you face and people kind of tell you, no, you can't do this. So I've had pivotal moments where um, I've changed my physical appearance I've seen some of your pictures. I know what you're talking about. You're a body, you're a bodybuilder. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. you were not obese in those pictures. No, no. And so it's just like an evolution. It's trying, proving to myself that I won't repeat history. And one of those things was, in some weird way, my psycho, my psyche was saying, if you can do these miles, you're not that person you used to be. Wow, that's interesting. That is interesting. That. I think the, the the trail, don't you find the trail allows you to find out stuff about yourself that you probably didn't know was there, or if you did know, it, it exaggerates or inflates it to a degree that it makes you look at it, makes you look at that problem. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's one of those things where I do, I believe everyone should read, 
go to people insight on anything you can do about the psychology before you go on a, a track. You can spend thousands of hours researching gear and, and shortcuts, maps, guides, depending on where you go. But the thing is, is are you mentally prepared and are you able to question your thought process while you're on the trail because of your past, you don't want that to dictate your decision making. Absolutely. I think Zach Davis did a really good book on that. Is it Appalachian Trial? Uh, if I, I stole my title from his book, uh, Appalachian Trial, which I think was a really good book about the the mental aspect of the hike. And so that, that comes back to that question, you know, whether you were prepared emotionally for the trail. Did you feel if if you went back in, you wouldn't be going in with those same emotions, I presume, because you'd know how it affects you, wouldn't you? Correct. It, I would be going in completely with a different mindset and with much more flexibility. It was um, it was a really hard time for me then, and yeah. it actually, luckily for me, while I was not emotionally prepared. I met the most amazing people and I was planning on doing everything by myself, but on day one, I met two gentlemen and I will forever be thankful, grateful, indebted to them for just how they kind of carried me for two weeks. And that in the two weeks, then I finally started to get my footing, wasn't so scared. And it truly, I attribute a lot of my growth of, of back into independence to them because they were patient and kind and helped me deal with the lack, the lack of confidence. But Chrissy, it's, it's, it is definitely a mindset. You have to allow yourself to let people to help you, don't you? And that's in life in general, but certainly on the trail, people are so willing to help that yeah. just accept it when they offer it, you know, and, and offer it yourself when you possibly can. And you become that person where, you know, you're prepared to help other people and they're prepared to help you. You know, I, I, I know we've banged on about this on the show quite often, but, the, the, the bad rap that hikers get on Facebook and so on, it's just so untrue. People are so damn kind on the tra trail and they, they want your success. And I'm sure they were helping you because they could see you. You were a bit nervous about the trail when you started. It, it truly was a gift. They did want to help. And yeah. the community is amazing. It's Every time I thought it was just going to end some sparkle of life, whether it was a gallon of water, a little box of candy, yeah. A person just coming up and saying hello, and you're like, wow, I haven't seen anyone all day, and I just realized this. It, yeah. Just a simple hello can be a rebirth of spirits. Yeah. Did you like the idea of flipping? Did you did you like that, or would you go from south to north or north to south next time if you were to do it again? That's a tricky question because I think about that. What I appreciate and loved uh, on the flip-flop is – how it helps preserve the trail and you can, depending on when you leave and where you start, get the best seasons of where you are on the trail. Yeah. There is something more, it seems, no, that doesn't mean it is true. Seems more simple. If I were to go, uh, you know, Novo or Southbound. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think I struggle to go Southbound because starting at the top of Katahdin and then doing New Hampshire and Maine to try to get my trail legs would be a nightmare for me. I mean, I say I'm doing it next year and I don't think I'll be, I just can't imagine myself starting um, in the North and I still want to, still want to finish at Katahdin. So I may or may not flip flop. If I flip, I might go from uh, where you started from Harper's mm -hmm. to Monson Mm -hmm. Back down to Harpers, Harpers down to Georgia, and then back up to Monson again. It might be a lot of driving around or getting planes, but it might be a nice way to still to allow me to finish on Katahdin. But I'll have to see how that works out. I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, it sounds pretty good to me, actually. Now, now I think about it more and more. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, I say it's lovely to catch up with you again. Nice to hear your um, you, you'd think about it again, and uh, and thanks for sharing as you as you do anyway. You share your story, and you did last time, and I really appreciate you talking to me. Well, thank you for the invite, and it's so good hearing your voice. Uh, and I maybe I'll see you on the trail. You just never know. You never know. <laughs> see you then. Sure. Bye. So we tried to squeeze everything into the show this week. It's been fun for me to do this show and look back at the previous 99 episodes while still looking to the future. I've already told you that Pat Coat is next week's guest and I've also told you my upcoming plans for the Camino and the AT show next year. The show will still be the Mighty Blue show, though some of the segments may change. When I podcast from both hikes, I'm considering two shows a week, 
both of which will be shorter than the normal 60 or 70 minute length of this programme. I'll still be interviewing, though it will be less formal and will certainly be face to face on whatever trail I'm on. It's been my honour to have you join me each week and I hope you stay with me for my upcoming adventures. (laughs) Let's face it, it wouldn't be half as much fun without you. To finish up this week, we have the second part of Chapter 10 of The Year We Seize the Day by Elizabeth Best and Colin Bowles. If you recall last week, Colin was confronted by some meaningful Latin words that struck a chord with him, carpe diem, or seize the day. This week, Elizabeth starts to discover the true joy in the trail, and she's happier than she's been at any time so far. So that is progress. I'll see you next week. Colin, one with all things except the French. I let Ellie go on ahead and step inside the Iglesia de la Asuncion. In the dark and musty interior, I find a magnificent statue of the Madonna and Child. I have a prayer to say on a piece of card, but it's too dark to read it. But the moment I kneel down, a light flickers on, on cue. Perhaps the verger or the priest opening the church for the day. An aria of Ave Maria echoes from the vaulted arches. I say the prayer quickly and leave. Call me hopeless or naive, but I have with me, on a cord around my neck, a prayer for a woman I know is going to fracture my soul in the manner with which she will soon dismiss me from her life. I still thank God for having met her and wish I never had. The prayer is for her and by her, and the bearing of it an act of obstinacy and healing. There's tenderness and anger in these supplications for her and for some God I cannot fathom, for touching me this way then leaving me with stark choices I feel inadequate to make. I have no defence for my actions but temporary insanity, for it is frankly a long time now since I have felt what other people call sane. My disguise has so far been impeccable. I walk out again into the sun-warmed cobbles and as I leave the town the road is a swarm with butterflies. I find myself stepping over ants and snails. I feel a certain kinship with an ant trying to drag a dead beetle ten times its size, twenty yards to its nest, a snail hauling itself in its Winnebago-sized home across the path, some other poor bastard trying to haul his load up a ridiculously steep incline. There have been times in my life when I have stepped on snails and ants for no better reason than that they were there and I was bored. Now they feel like family to me. Crazy. But I wonder how I would feel if someone stepped on me right now. Relieved, probably. Ellie, Enigma. I fall in love with my place here today. Walking alone, I suddenly catch myself realising I am the happiest I have been since first setting out along the Camino. Colin and I have been walking apart since breakfast, still with two hours to Najera. Pacing to the sound of Enigma through my headphones, I approach the peak of a loping knoll. With the march of the Gregorian beat in my feet, the music makes the scenery surreal. Suddenly, I am stepping out of my own movie scene. With the burnt yellow fields behind me, I reach the summit to find a valley sweeping down in a sea of green. On the horizon are a handful of distant hills with churches perched on top, possibly tomorrow's destinations. A towering communications antenna piercing the sky between them. It is stunning. And for a nice change, there's not a grain of wheat in sight. A gentle breeze sweeps through the valley and brushes against my skin, bringing with it a sense of freedom and even belonging that I've not experienced here before. It is one of those rare and precious moments when you realise that everything is perfect. All the pieces fall into place and everything fits. Such moments never last, and they are not yours to keep. A fellow Australian on the Camino told me a few days ago how the airline lost his baggage on the way to Spain. He arrived with nothing but the clothes on his back, a bottle of water, a visa card and some change in his pocket. He started his walk anyway. When the airline contacted him via email to say his bag had arrived, he told them to return it to Sydney. I didn't want it anymore. There's a certain freedom in poverty, you know. Out here, material things don't mean as much as they did at home. Letting go of them is like cutting a second umbilical cord. Expecting nothing, accepting everything, surrendering to each moment as it arrives. Having the courage and faith to trust you have everything you need to be okay. I have less in my pack now than when I came. Tomorrow I will have less than I have today. 
Every day so far, I have asked myself what the hell I'm doing here. But instead, before stepping off the hill this afternoon, I take a moment to say thank you. Ellie. Cats, dogs and buckets of Colin. I love rainy days, but when you're caught in a downpour holding grocery bags under the narrow terrace of a supermercado that's just lost its power in the storm and the staff have locked the doors behind you, well, it takes much of the fun away. This isn't just ordinary rain. This is a torrent with deafening thunder, an impressive light show and flash flooding, all in the time it takes for me to make my way from aisle three to the checkout. Nobody knows where I am. When I left, I wasn't even sure where I was going. Colin, Mercedes and Simon are all waiting at Elberg for me to return to prepare dinner. The streets are empty, cars have been abandoned by the roadside and I have nothing but a nearby sheet of cardboard to use as shelter. My satchel contains my most valuable possessions, passports, MP3 player, notepad and dictaphone. I am wearing my only dry clothes and I have just spent an hour cleaning and redressing my feet with fresh dry gauze. Minutes pass. 5, 10, 25. Stripped down to a singlet in the stifling humidity, I watch as the two checkout chicks from the supermercado are picked up and whisked away in waiting cars. The storm has set in. It is just five o'clock, but already it is dark. Looks like I'm here for the long haul. So I prop against the wall and drift off with the hypnotic drone of rain on the roof. I think back to an old homeless man I used to pass on Swanston Street at 5am each morning on my way to work in the city. Huddled in the corner of a dimly lit doorway as the rain beat down on a bleak Melbourne dawn. Jack lay curled beneath the sheets of newspaper with a filthy blanket and a piece of cardboard for a pillow. Every Friday, I would leave home early to buy him a coffee and spend time there in his doorway. Jack hated the rain, dreaded it, in fact. A particularly wet or cold winter for him could mean the difference between life and death. It occurred to me then, as it does now, standing in my own doorway in Spain, that maybe I've always liked rainy days because I've always had the privilege to enjoy them. A warm shower a fresh set of clothes and heating on the other end of a slow walk home. Not today. My reverie is interrupted by the sight of a hooded caped crusader bounding towards me through the dark, splashing across an empty street and hurdling ankle-deep puddles. Colin has come to my rescue. Hey, Tonto, he says as he slips beneath the terrace. What are you doing here? How'd you find me? When I heard the rain, I asked directions to the biggest supermarket in town, he smiles. It wasn't hard. Passing me his plastic poncho, he takes the grocery bags from my hands. Here you go, mate. Let's get you out of here, hey? Still stunned by the effort, and more than a little grateful, I stretch his plastic poncho above our heads. Huddled underneath, we venture out into the deluge, dashing back through the empty streets toward the Alberg, stamping in puddles along the way. Suddenly, the rain doesn't seem so bad again. Colin, losing my religion. I was raised High Anglican, but God or spirituality has never figured largely in my life. Out here on the Camino, I am definitely looking for something. I have now come to suspect that a life is not lived on any meaningful level without an aspect of spirituality running beneath it, like an underground stream that gives the ground above its sustenance. My underground stream is a trickle. I am losing my religion. Every town, every village has a church, and I go into each one, seeing them with new eyes, inquisitive, curious, questioning. Many, to my disgust, are locked. Some you even have to pay to enter. Pay as you pray. There is something repellent in this. Is this a church or a museum? If the Catholic Church has so much stuff they are worried about people nicking things, well, maybe they should not have so much stuff. Is a church somewhere to pray or somewhere to store the loot? One day, as we were walking, Ellie asks me, What would you do if you met God? And the answer comes back without thinking. I'd take him by the shoulders, look him right in the eye, and knee him in the balls. This is how I've come to see God. Thump. That's for all the children starving in Africa. Thump. That's for my friend's kid who drowned in the bath. Thump. That's for the Inquisition. I'm not being flippant. I know the fault does not lie with whatever great intelligence created all of this. 
The error is in my spiritual education. I was always taught to fear God, and I did. For most of my life, I've been terrified of the bastard. He was portrayed to me as a sort of grim Father Christmas with PMT. Rigid, judgmental, no sense of proportion, never did a thing wrong in his whole life, and sits up there tut-tutting every time I look like having a good time or a carnal thought. People have told me I should love God. How do you love someone who has no sense of humour? So what is God? Perhaps God is like gravity, just a force that works whether we believe in it or not, a law that just is. God is also a symbol, an image we carry in our minds, our GPS of where we are in the universe. Sorting through this rich stew of Catholic and Templar churches, I'm aware of a new God, and I actually like this one. This symbol does not make me feel guilty or afraid and inspires in me compassion, warmth and humility. It is the Madonna. Not the Madonna, Mother of God and Archetypal Virgin, the one who looks like Mother Teresa with a prune up her ass, for I've noticed that the Madonnas are all slightly different. The one I'm drawn to is the other Madonna, the slightly edgy one who radiates a sort of sensuality and compassion, the pagan Madonna who looks like a real woman and not the national president of the council against swearing on television. In some churches, especially the Templar ones, the images are pagan. Compassion and human desire and frailty are depicted in these ageless statues. These other Madonnas touch me somehow at a primal level, and it is here one Thursday morning in a small church after a coffee and a chocolate croissant that I experience for the first time the stirring of spiritual feeling. It's a sense of affection rather than venal hope for what some deity may be able to do for me in this world or the next. But this is just between you and me. I would not want this sort of sentiment to become widely known. My mates at the footy club will think I've thrown a screw, or worse, joined a group in which they fondle crystals and do male bonding. Having said that, it could just be that everyone feels like this after a chocolate croissant. They are really very good. That afternoon, when we reach the old bag in Najera, Ellie is still fretting about the hostelero who abused her in Logroño, so she decides to start preparing dinner for the four of us her, Mercedes, Simon and myself, to try to take her mind off it. He hated me, she mutters as she finally sits down. That's not true, I tell her. How could anyone hate you? Just then, a French pilgrim we have not seen since Pointe la Reine walks in. Ellie smiles and holds out her arms for a hug. Ben! He steps back like she's a leper and points his finger at her head. You stole my pen, he shouts. I hate you! <laughs>